that lies beyond. Good evening, folks. Welcome to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the Von Karman series. My name is Brian White from JPL's Office of Communication and Education, and welcome to tonight's talk, It Broke, a Story of How We Fixed It. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Percentage-wise, NASA JPL has a pretty good track record. Our curiosity has given us insight on Mars, and a few voyagers have set some golden records. But so. <laughs> You know where you're at, right? <laughs> Let your nerd flag fly. So tonight we're going to tell you a story maybe you haven't heard before and you would be forgiven for not remembering this spacecraft. The tale of stress and ingenuity of Deep Space One, a dedicated group of individuals that worked tirelessly to save a spacecraft farther away than our sun, is a story of hope and what we of human beings are capable. In the immortal words of Commander Peter Taggart, Never give up, never surrender. <laughs> Our speaker tonight grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and earned a BA in physics from Princeton University. He received an MS in physics from the University of Colorado in Boulder, moving over to the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics, where he received his PhD. He joined JPL in 1986, has been the recipient of numerous honors, and is the only person to have received both the Exceptional Technical Excellence Award and the Exceptional Leadership Award, two of JPL's most prestigious honors. He holds a black belt in karate, teaches dance with his wife, who is also a brain scientist. Yeah, he is one of those JPL underachievers. Please welcome Dr. Mark Raymond. Thank you. Hi, Brian. Hi. Let's get right into it. Okay. What was it that led you here to JPL? Well, so. I've, I've been a space enthusiast since I was four years old. Uh, I've just loved it my whole life. I decided when I was in the fourth grade that I wanted to get a PhD in physics and work for NASA. Uh, it was a few more years till I did. Okay. But, but when I was in the fourth grade is when I wrote to JPL for the first time, um, as well as other NASA centers and other scientific organizations around the country and even around the world. So to me, working here is it's truly a dream come true. I mean, I love it. I just love it. It is so cool. And every day, I just feel so, so fortunate. It is just, it's tremendous. It's fun. So I it, feel like I'm getting paid to do my hobby. Well, don't tell anybody that. <laughs> you I don't get paid that much, so it's okay. <laughs> you've got a great, I feel like you've had your, your dream job multiple times. I have. Yeah. What yeah. were some of the missions that you've been well, so I've, on? I've worked on a number of fun things. Uh, working on system to use lasers instead of radios for communicating with spacecraft far into the solar system. Very cool. Worked on a laser altimeter for Mars, uh, an infrared space telescope, <laughs> missions to search for and characterize planets around other stars. Um, uh, worked on a mission to, um, to uh, measure the heights of waves on the ocean, uh, sample, return a sample from Mars. You got some lots game. Of, yeah. Lots of fun things. Lots of fun things. Yeah. Uh, but this was your, what we're going to talk about tonight, this is your first end-to-end -end from vague concept cocktail napkin to the end of a successful, spoiler alert, the end of a successful mission. Right. This is the first time I took one from the very beginning to the very end. Okay. And how did that, what did, this one behind me, what did it stem yeah, out of? Yeah. So that's Deep Space One. Yeah. So uh, what did you say? What did it stem out of? Where did it? Okay. So the, in the 1990s, there was a recognition that NASA was, had sort of gotten into a vicious cycle, okay. where when, when NASA started, it was always using the most cutting edge advanced technologies. But after a while, that stopped. And you can understand why. If, if you're responsible for a multi-hundred million dollar mission, you're not rewarded for taking a risk. You're rewarded for getting the mission accomplished, for being successful. And the best way to be successful is not to take a risk with some fancy new technology. Rather, it's to use something that the guy before you used. Okay. Because you know that it works in space. It can survive the radiation, the temperature, the rocket ride, the, all the forbidding aspects of a, of a mission in space. 
And so NASA got into this cycle of using older and older and older technology, recognizing that if that there were promising new technologies, but nobody would use them until somebody else did. So in the mid-90s, we started a program called the New Millennium Program okay. that was designed to test these high-risk advanced technologies. And if they worked, then subsequent missions would use them without incurring the risk. So basically, Deep Space One and the other missions of the so-called New Millennium Program were designed to take the risks so future missions wouldn't have to. So here's Deep Space One, <laughs> and we had these 12 astounding technologies, and the point of the mission was to exercise these on an operational interplanetary mission. And, and when we were talking about this, you wanted me to make it very clear to me that Deep Space One actually did not have a science question it needed to answer. Right, not in the conventional sense. Yes. The question that we were asking was, how well do these technologies work? Can we rely on them for future missions? Can, you know, can they live up to their promise? If they can't, then we'll find out on DS-1 and not subject these subsequent missions to, to, these, to these risks. Mm -hmm. But we had some fancy technologies, ion propulsion, which I first heard of in a Star Trek episode. <laughs> um, and uh, in fact, that became a very important technology on another mission I worked on that just completed at the end of last year with a spacecraft orbiting a dwarf planet between Mars and Jupiter, taking advantage of that. Very cool. We had this mind of its own, means we had some artificial intelligence, smart onboard systems uh, that we didn't want to risk a mission with those until we, until we tested them out. And so that was the objective of the mission. You get this, this great mission, your primary, your primary mission was for how long? It was 11 months. 11 months. Right. So from build to through that primary mission, how, about, how long is that supposed to be? Well, normally it takes more like five years or so oh. from the time you conceive of it until the time you launch. Uh, DS-1, shown here on the left when it was being built, just a few hundred yards from here, as we say, up the hill mm -hmm. in that direction, uh, we did in three years. And it was, at that time, the lowest cost interplanetary mission NASA had ever done. Uh, and part of the idea was to see if we can, again, break out of this cycle of big, expensive missions using out-of-date technology. OK, so you've got this great photo of the spacecraft. Right, and I should just say the solar arrays are not mounted to it here, so you're just seeing the, the main spacecraft structure. OK. Uh, you've got that beautiful launch photo on October 24th, 1998. Right. It's a beautiful launch. Uh, and actually, I just include here also my favorite picture of DS-1. Sure. So I worked on it a lot, spent a lot of time in the clean room. But <clears throat> excuse me, this is my favorite picture. So this was taken by the uh, famous 200-inch Hale telescope on Palomar. Uh, and there's DS-1 when it was nine times farther away than the moon. <laughs> and this is, this is one of the greatest distances at which a human-made spacecraft has ever been photographed, at which a human-made object has ever been photographed. When this picture was taken, it was four million times fainter than you could see with your naked eye. And I, I, I love this picture. Yeah. You know, when a telescope takes a picture of something, of you know, the stars, the telescope, of course, has to move to counteract Earth's rotation. Okay. That's why the stars are you know, circular, focused sort of dots. The shape of DS-1 there doesn't tell you anything about the shape of the spacecraft, but rather it had its own independent motion through the solar system while this picture was taken. And so to me, this just says, we have a spacecraft out among the stars. I mean, what could be cooler than that? So I, I just really love this picture. I love your excitement already. <laughs> uh, so you get this great photo. Uh, you're out there. You've got a. Everything's going well. The technologies like, are proven. Uh, right. We put them through their paces. It was a very intensive, very demanding mission. You know, most missions when you launch, they travel a long time before they get to their destination. Yep. But for DS-1, we were immediately testing out these technologies, putting them through their paces, seeing how well they would work, challenging them. And you even got you got some a bonus thing out of this. You got a we did a, a flyby. Right. So the because we had the ion propulsion, mm -hmm. 
uh, which is uniquely capable, far, far, far more capable than conventional propulsion. And we had this so-called autonomous navigation system that is where the spacecraft could navigate itself. We wanted to prove that we could do more than just send the spacecraft out into the solar system and sort of putter around, but rather that we could actually travel to a specific solar system destination. And so, uh, again, we launched in October mm -hmm. of 98. In July of 1999, we flew by an asteroid to prove that we could uh, travel to, navigate to a specific destination in space, because that's what these technologies would have to do if they were used again. Very cool. And you get so you get to the end of this 11-month prime mission, right? And you got a you got a spacecraft up there. We do. We had a healthy spacecraft out there in the solar system, and I don't know about you, but the rest of us here who were taxpayers, we'd all paid for this <laughs> spacecraft, and <laughs> and we wanted to take the best advantage of it. Uh, and so we actually proposed to NASA headquarters a so-called extended mission, okay. a new thing to do with the spacecraft. And they concurred. Instead of testing more technologies, the idea was to fly for another two years at the end of this 11-month mission to fly to a comet and get a close-up picture of the comet. And at that time, we did not have good close-up pictures <coughs> of comets. So this would be NASA's first attempt to send a spacecraft to Comet. Now, of course, we've all seen cool pictures of comets. You know, there's a big, sort of roughly circular cloud of gas and dust called the coma. And that can be many thousands and thousands of miles across, bigger than Earth sometimes. And a tail that can be even, in some cases, millions of miles long. But deep inside that coma is a small, solid object that can be a fraction of a mile or maybe a few miles across, too small to be seen well from Earth. And so our ambitious proposal, that, I mean, how hard could this be, was to fly for another uh, two years and uh, at that point roughly a billion miles or so and plunge into this coma and take a picture of the nucleus. That sounds like a great idea, but this <laughs> isn't it worked a story of nothing going wrong. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I'm guessing something happened on the way. That's right. It did. Uh, on November 11th, 1999, just a couple of months into this extended mission, disaster struck. So um, the, there's a device on the spacecraft called a star tracker. This is a clever name because it tracks stars. <laughs> and the idea of this thing is in the zero gravity of space, far from anything, spacecraft needs help to figure out its orientation. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we figure out our orientation here on the ground by we sense gravity yep. and we might recognize landmarks. You might use a compass, for example, to tell you that that's north or you might, uh, you might recognize star patterns, you know, the North Star or the Big Dipper, Orion, Scorpius, whatever, you know, star patterns are familiar to you. Well, the Star Tracker actually worked the same way. It was a camera and a computer together in one unit. This was not one of our advanced technologies, but it would regularly take pictures of the stars. It would recognize the star patterns. Mm -hmm. And so then it would say to the computer, I recognize that star pattern, so I'm looking in that direction. I'm oriented this way. And that's how the spacecraft knew in the zero gravity of space how it was oriented until November 11th, 1999. <laughs> I mean, until January, sorry, no, yeah, November 11th, no, 1999. November, uh, it failed. And so the spacecraft then responded with what we call a safe mode. This is protective software that's designed to respond when there's a problem. And DS-1 had sort of three levels of this. Mm -hmm. And it responded with the one appropriately for the worst situations. Oh, good. And so we, we need to spend a moment here discussing what it did so that you understand then the problem we were confronted with. So it used a sun sensor. Wherever you are in the solar system, I'm sure you all know this, wherever you've been in the solar system, the one thing you can always spot is the sun. So it had a device to find the sun, would turn and point at that, didn't know where Earth was or how to point at Earth, so it transmitted a very broad radio signal, very broad, figuring Earth would be in the, somewhere within that signal, and then it would just rotate about once per hour. So we saw some artist concepts earlier of the spacecraft, but just want to take another 
look at it here to orient you so you can follow it. So here's the spacecraft again, and the solar rays are just folded up here on the side here and here. Um, here's the sun sensor. So this thing was designed just to spot the sun. Here's the main antenna, but the main antenna was aligned with the sun sensor, so it was pointed at the sun, not at Earth. There's also an auxiliary antenna here that could transmit this broad beam instead of a narrow radio beam. And because it'll come up later, I just want to show you in the back here is a camera. We'll come back to that. Spoiler. Yeah. And as long as we're looking at it, uh, also there's the Star Tracker, but uh, <laughs> we're, th that was our assessment of the Star Tracker. So now with this, with the main antenna pointed at the sun in this broad beam, we could just barely communicate with the spacecraft. And remember, this was after the prime mission, so it was already farther away than we had ever planned for it to be. And perhaps you know that when we communicate with interplanetary spacecraft, we use the deep space network. These are these big antennas that we have, a, a complex of a few of them, near, near Goldstone here in California, near Madrid, Spain, and near Canberra, Australia. So by being spaced around Earth, we have them pointed in all directions. And these are big antennas. Only the ones that were 112 feet in diameter were, had the equipment to transmit at DS-1's radio frequency. So those were the only kind we could use to send a signal to the spacecraft. However, it was so far away and using this weak antenna, only the 230 foot diameter antennas could actually receive the signal from it. So there are three of these antennas on our whole planet, and of course they were busy doing other things. And so now we had to schedule the use of simultaneously a 112 foot antenna and a 230 foot antenna just to communicate. And the rate at which we communicated was about a quarter of how oh, no. fast we're talking. <laughs> Comparable to a good Morse code operator. A good Morse code operator. A good one. Okay, yeah. not me trying it for the first time. A good <laughs> right. one. Right, but not good enough for serious interplanetary communications. That sounds and uh, it, it sounds impossible. It sounds like. Well, and in fact, so I I don't I I wasn't happy about this. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean the the in all seriousness, the real assessment was this is fatal. Yeah. This is a catastrophic failure. We should retire the spacecraft that had, had an incredibly successful mission, retire the spacecraft and let it rest on its laurels. This was catastrophic. And that's what most people, uh, that was the perspective that most people had. You, but you have come up from four years old knowing how to do this, going through the people walking on the moon. I get the feeling that is not the type of person that you are, Mark. That's right. My philosophy was if it isn't impossible, it isn't worth doing. Yeah. <laughs> and we wanted to fix this thing. And the first challenge was just to point the antenna at Earth. Okay. Could we do that so we could communicate with it for the possibility that there might be something we could do to salvage the mission? So how do you start how do you even start thinking about this? Well, you, you you sort of think about, I don't know if you've ever seen the Apollo 13 movie. Yes. You, there's a scene in there where the guy walks into a room and has a box and dumps it on the table, you know, and there's duct tape and a few pens and pencils and notebook paper and, you know, a moon boot and things like that and says, okay, this is what we've got to work with and now we've got to make this circular device fit into this square device, <clears throat> excuse me, so we can get the air from the lunar module uh, communicating yeah. with yeah, the air in the command module. So you just sort of look around on the spacecraft and you say, what have we got to work with? Because well, you can't and, pull over to the Jiffy Lube and fix right, something. Right. At, yeah. at this point, the spacecraft was 150 million miles from Earth, it was 600 or something like that, 600 times farther away, more than 600 times, actually farther away than the moon. Um, at this point, well, well in excess of half a million times farther than astronauts on the International Space Station. Okay. So it was up to, I mean, all we could, 
all we could work with was what was there, and we could send ones and zeros. All right. So what do we have? How do we? How, what's the first step on this? Well, the first step. Maybe we could demonstrate it. I would love to do that. But is it just going to be the two of us? No, I think we need some assistance. Okay. Yeah, he's right over here. Time he for Mason. Okay. So we, we've uh, we've got Mason to Mason, help us right? here, and I have a high fidelity model here <laughs> of the spacecraft. <clears throat> So I should tell you, this is actually a high fidelity model of a different spacecraft, one that I worked on called Dawn, which is now uh, circling a dwarf planet. This was made by the four-year-old daughter uh, of a colleague of mine. Uh, the daughter is Laura Ratliff. She's now an undergraduate at Georgetown. But um, even when she was four, I think she did better making this than I could now. Um, and the reason I'm using it <coughs> excuse me, is it's close enough to DS-1. It has its solar rays. This is the main antenna, and here's the camera. And that's, that's what you need to know. And so uh, we're going to ask Mason here to be the Earth. Mason is going to be the Earth. This is not to scale. <laughs> <laughs> right, I think Mason's actually bigger to scale than yes. that would indicate. So hold that up so everybody can see. There's Earth. OK. What and else do you need? We need the sun. I sometimes think I'm the center of attention, so I'll yeah. come over here. OK, right. And, and your mom says you're bright, so there you go. She did once, okay. yes. So, <clears throat> so the situation was DS-1, only all it could do was find the sun. It didn't know where Earth was if you see the sun. So it points its antenna there at the sun, and it's just doing this. OK? So. The way we got the antenna to Earth, and this took us two months just to figure this out, was instead of having it rotate around the antenna like that, instead we said, we know, the spacecraft doesn't know, but we know the angle from the sun to the spacecraft to the Earth. Let's say in this case, the angle from Brian to DS-1 to Mason is, say, 90 degrees. So instead of having it rotate like that, we say, turn this way, or actually turn this way, mm -hmm. and now rotate like that. OK? So it's rotating like that. It's still sending this signal through the main antenna, and it doesn't know where either Earth or Mason are, but it's doing that. Now, I'm also going to bring in here, just for illustration, uh, another high-tech device, a flashlight. People on TV won't be able to see this very well, but trust me, it's just projecting light. And so as the spacecraft rotates, sometimes this beam of light will go over Earth. I'm not using a laser for obvious reasons. <laughs> but, uh, and then it continues on. But the point is, instead of, so it's just this narrow beam that sweeps past and then goes around and then comes by again. Now, because of the, another consequence of the failure of the Star Tracker was we couldn't even tell the spacecraft exactly how fast to turn. So we didn't know how fast it was rotating, and neither did it. But every time this beam would sweep past Earth, this radio beam, we would detect the sort of blip at the deep space network and then we'd, have, we'd ask Mason to say, there it is. And then it would go around. And roughly an hour later, it would sweep past again. Did you hear him? There it is. OK. And the real signal was a lot weaker than that. <laughs> and so we'd do this a few times. And so then we could just measure the rate at which the spacecraft was turning. That was the first step. Then we would just calculate. This part, of course, is pretty easy. When's the next time the antenna is going to be pointed at Earth? Now, the spacecraft was so far away that radio signals took around 14 minutes to travel from Earth to the spacecraft. It's a long way, even for signals <coughs> excuse me, traveling at the speed of light. So we would calculate when the next time the antenna was going to be pointed at Earth send a radio signal timed so that just when the antenna was pointed at Earth for that brief moment, the signal would get there and say, stop rotating. However, 
we knew the spacecraft can't stop on a dime, and so it would actually overshoot a little bit. But we had calculated that, and so we were really told it to do is stop and back up. And it worked perfectly. And so for the first time in two months, we finally had the main antenna pointed at Mason. Very cool. Good job, Mason. Thank you, Mason. <laughs> and Mason was, was very brave here today, uh, getting up on stage. I know a lot of people don't like to do that. That is my favorite stress ball. It is yours now. And so is, and here's a little picture of Deep Space One. And everybody who works in NASA knows one of the most important things is a cool lapel pin. So here's a pin for Deep Space One. Good job, Mason. So, and when you come to work at JPL, we expect you to put that up on your wall and wear the pin. Yeah. Very cool. So we finally had the antenna pointed at Earth. That actually allowed us to restore normal communications, not like you would have with you know, your home internet yeah. connection. It's sort of dial-up modem speed. But that's how we communicate with interplanetary spacecraft. I want to take a half but, step back on this, because I also want to know how much time did you, because if you're going to go meet something out there, there's a time limit. It's not that's just right. you have every day, all day, for years to do this. That's right. So we, we had this, this exotic ion propulsion system. Mm -hmm. If we were going to meet our, so we're, our date with the comet was in September 2001. Okay. So the comet was going to be at a particular place in the solar system. That's where we had to meet it. To get there, we had to resume thrusting with the ion propulsion system no later than July 5th of 2000. So again, the Star Tracker failed in November of 99. Mm -hmm. It took us two months to get the antenna pointed at Earth. That, so that was January. We had till July. And I should also point out that I mean, maybe most people don't know, but the, in fact, 100% of spacecraft prior to DS-1, not just most of them, but all of them, including Voyager here and you know all, all spacecraft, coast most of the time. Okay. Just like Earth coasts in orbit around the sun and the moon coasts in orbit around the Earth and the International Space Station coasts in orbit around the Earth. But with ion propulsion, you have to thrust most of the time. So we needed to get thrusting with that ion propulsion system by July to make our date with the comet. Essentially, you've got <coughs> one Major League Baseball season from disaster to getting this thing moving again. And it's not like oh, cram the night before and suddenly you're good. That's right. Good. That's yeah. right. You can't wait until, you can't pull an all-nighter on July 4th. Yeah. And, and this system that we got working was great, but it was very laborious because every time this, when we had the antenna pointed at Earth, the spacecraft would continue to drift around a little bit because the Star Tracker had failed. And so when we would see that it was drifting by measuring the radio signal, we would then have to send a command to say, move a degree this way, or move two degrees that way. So we had to have a team in mission control, basically joysticking the spacecraft from 150 million miles away. And think of a joystick where you make a move, and it's 28 minutes before you see the effect because of this round trip radio signal. Mm -hmm. And I should just point out one more thing. Of course. <coughs> Even, even apart from that problem, here's the antenna pointed at Earth. Well, suppose we want to point the ion engine in that direction there. Say this is the ion engine here. Well, you point it there, you can't have the antenna pointed at Earth anymore. So we couldn't, even if the joysticking were possible, we couldn't do it because we needed to keep the antenna on Earth. So there was no way to point the ion engine in the direction needed to get to the comet. And even if we had gotten there, then we'd need to point the camera yeah. at it. So this was great for getting started, but entirely inadequate for, for conducting this mission. So how long were you playing this galactic pong, essentially, the, the initial part of this, the establishing the connection? How long did that take? That took us two months. That took so we two got, months. We got that in the second half of January of 2000, and then we had until the beginning of July to invent a way to fix a spacecraft that by all rights, should be declared dead. And if you're, you're having to play this galactic pong, 
this was something we were talking about. Did, I mean, did you have an ace there 24 hours a day? Well, so an ace for people's uh, now, ace is the guy or the lady in mission control who actually is responsible for clicking the mouse to send the signal from mission control, just a few hundred yards here, out to the deep space network and then out to the spacecraft. No, we didn't. We had too small a team, and in fact, no mission is staffed 24 hours a day. There aren't enough antennas of the deep space network to do that. Spacecraft have to be able to operate on their own. So we would go through this laborious procedure of getting the antenna pointed to Earth. We'd have a communication session with it, and then when we were finished, we actually had to have it go back to pointing at the sun. And then a few days later, when we wanted to communicate with it again, there would be a different angle between the sun, the spacecraft, and Earth. So we'd have to change it by a different angle, have it sweep around a few times. It took hours and hours every time we did this just to communicate. This, this wasn't going to do it, so we had to come up with a different method. You've got to find a new way to control the spacecraft without a 24-hour, or without, connect, without a connection to Earth. That's right, right, without a connection to Earth. No micromanaging. Right. Yes. And so we, again, looked at the spacecraft. What do we have on board the spacecraft that can sense the external environment in a way other than the sun sensor mm -hmm. and other than the radio? And the, to us, the best solution seemed to be with the camera. Okay. And so I mean, camera seems like a pretty good way to do it. it can take pictures. And so, I mean, how hard could this be, right? We've got a spacecraft that maybe should be dead, but you can fix it. But to explain why this is hard, I want to walk you th through some of the differences between the camera, the star tracker, and the camera. And the first is the field of view. How much sky could the star tracker see? Okay. It was 300 times the area of the full moon. So if you're out at night, think of the full moon. If you could see an area 300 times that, that's a pretty sizable chunk of the sky. The camera could only see an area twice the size of the moon. Okay. So that's, a, that's better for the, that means the star tracker is better in that regard. Thumbs up star tracker. Right. All right. Okay, now, the star tracker actually could see fainter stars than we can see. Stars that are, in this case, they're four times fainter. So it had a lot of stars to choose from. The camera, again, wasn't built to photograph stars. So it could only see stars comparable in brightness to the ones we can see. So once again, that's a point in favor of the star tracker. And so the problem was, in general, when you're orienting the spacecraft, the, star tra the camera is not going to be able to be pointed at a recognizable star pattern. Okay. So that didn't seem very good. No. But it turns out to be harder than that because <laughs> the star tracker was designed to determine its orientation. It had a dedicated computer for that. And so it sent to the main spacecraft computer a mathematical description of the spacecraft's orientation. It would say, you're pointed, you know, pointed there and oriented like this, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Whereas all the camera could do was just take a picture of whatever it's looking at. And so that, that didn't do anybody any good. And so once again, that was a a thumb up in favor of the Star, star Tracker. Star wins, yeah. And once again, the Star Tracker was built specifically to do this. It was dedicated to it. So it had the capability to do this every quarter of a second, four times a second. It could calculate, it could measure its orientation and tell it to the spacecraft computer. This was before the days of modern digital cameras like everybody here has in their smartphones. Mm -hmm. And the camera on board the spacecraft could only take a picture, process it, and send it to the computer and have the computer open it once every 30 seconds. Once again, Star Tracker. I think I know something that the camera has that the Star Tracker doesn't at this right, point. Right, the camera had one major thing going for it. Mm -hmm. It was alive. <laughs> Star Tracker was dead. So to me, that thumb up uh, outweighed yeah. all the others. I think that's the only yes, yeah. it takes precedent. Right. So, so you have to train a camera, and you have to train it like the old disposal, where you have to spin, like that kind of time in between. Right. Um, we had to come up with a whole new method yeah. to make this work, and um, with a spacecraft that's, you know, almost twice as far away as the sun, uh, and we've got to do it in just a few months. This was 
Was it a calm time to be working here at JPL, or no, particularly calm, to be a part of DS1? No, calm isn't one of the, the words that comes to mind. <laughs> um, I could think of a whole lot of other ones, but we're yeah. on TV right now. Well, actually, I can, too. Um, the, the, you know, we had people working seven days a week, long hours. Yeah. You just, you could never stop. You couldn't rest. You couldn't. You just couldn't wait. I mean, to me, this is what it felt like to me. Um, this, this is just incredibly stressful, and that's that's my stressometer there. Uh, you, it, it's just incredible. I mean, you know, all everybody that works at JPL solves hard problems. Yeah. And everybody that's worked on these these spacecraft around here has solved hard problems. And I don't mean to diminish that at all. But most of the hardest problems they have to solve are while the spacecraft is on the ground, figuring out how to design and build and plan out how you're going to operate it. But we had the spacecraft, again, over 150 million miles away with the clock ticking there uh, constantly. And we had to come up with a whole new way to do this. You said to me that the people who are surprised the most that yeah. the spacecraft works are the people who work on that spacecraft. That's right. A friend of mine said this. Maybe he's even watching it. Hi, George. Uh, the, you know all the ways things can go wrong, and you know all the problems, all the skeletons in the closet, all the, all the difficulties. And as much as I've described it here, I mean, there were just uncountable number of problems. And every time we'd solve one, we'd discover five more. And um, and we had to, again, had to do this in a few months. And then the spacecraft was going to have to travel another 650 million miles in 15 months, yeah. you know, reliably to get to the comet. So every solution you create causes another problem. Everything, you're rushing, you're turning a, a camera, which is not built, you're turning your spacecraft into a different spacecraft. That's exactly right. I mean, it... it genuinely felt like by the, by the time we had done this, we were flying a different one from the one we had designed and built. So we not only had to come up with new systems to work on the spacecraft, but wholly different approaches to how to fly the spacecraft. So you wake up, you're stressed out, you're thinking about it. No, I, okay. I, I, I wouldn't exactly say that because that, that sort of assumes I slept. Um, <laughs> I, 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 it was just, it was stressful. Yeah. It was just really stressful. But it was. Yeah. But you got, there was neither time nor, um, nor enough relaxation okay. to, to sleep well. I bet. Um, but you get the Star Trek, you get the camera turned into a Star Trekker. Right. So the, the basic idea, I don't want to go into it detail because it's, it's complicated. Okay. But the, the basic idea was we, we had to pick individual isolated bright stars, isolated because we couldn't afford to let the spacecraft mistakenly lock to a nearby star. These distinct stars. Right, there. distinct stars. We would select them. So let's say, here again is the ion engine. Let's say we want to point the ion engine in this direction. Okay. Then we would have to find a star in that direction because the camera, sorry, here from your point of view, here's the camera and it looks this way. The camera points there, so we would tell the spacecraft, turn to approximately that location, okay. start taking pictures, find the star, lock onto it, and once it's locked on, then we know the ion engine is pointed there. So then thrust with the ion engine like that. Okay. Then when it's time to point the ion engine in, I don't say this direction here, yeah. we'd pick a star over there, and we would have to tell the spacecraft what the star is, how bright it is, approximately how to turn to it. So it would turn, and then it would drift around, but it would take pictures and find the star, lock onto it, and then it would know the ion engine was pointed there. And then when it was time to communicate with Earth, if we want the antenna, now let's say Earth is over there, over there yeah. we'd say, well, there's a star up there, turn and point to that. So it would turn and point to that star, and then the antenna would be pointed at Earth for our regular communication session so we could yeah. you know, do our normal monitoring of the spacecraft and give it the new 
uh, information to continue the mission. And you get this all tested out. You get this all f finally to a point where you're going, this is it. We've there's no there's no more time. It's it's now or never. When does that happen in our in our so again cutoff date? The the failure occurred in November. Mm -hmm. We first got the antenna even pointed to Earth in late January. Yep. And in early June, we transmitted the software to the spacecraft using the same method we would then at that point have been using for uh, for half a year. Um, during which time the spacecraft had coasted 350 million miles, but not where we needed it to be to get to the comet. So we had the software on board the spacecraft uh, in the second week of June, mm -hmm. turned it on, activated it. To everybody's amazement, it actually worked great. So for the first time in seven months, we had the spacecraft sort of operating in kind of a normal way. I mean, we had we had actually rescued this spacecraft, taking seven months. And if you've heard of this safe mode, I don't think any, I'm sure no JPL spacecraft, has, no US, no NASA spacecraft has ever spent so long essentially in safe mode and then been rescued. So now then all we had to do was 15 months, 650 million miles, fly to the comet and figure out how to take pictures there with this aged, wounded, Crippled spacecraft. I mean, that was all, all was left to do at that point. Okay, you got it working. You're like, I'm going on vacation. See you guys. Yeah. Yeah, um, not probably not. Not, not exactly. Yeah. All right. So you got to fly to the spacecraft um, on this 15 month comet. fly to the iPod. You're flying yeah. the spacecraft <laughs> to the comet. Um, but this was a that's another 15 months added on. Plus, you've got this. The, the spacecraft was designed for an 11 month primary mission. That's right. And at this point, it had been in flight now for almost two years. Yeah. And um, one of the consequences of flying for so much longer than originally anticipated is that we were running low on a resource that we had on the spacecraft. So s spacecraft carries a small supply of a conventional rocket propellant called hydrazine. And I, I told you about the star tracker and now the camera. That's how the spacecraft figures out where it's pointed but it needs to control its orientation. It's not good enough just to know it. Yeah. It needs to control it. So it has these little thrusters, like here's a thruster and here's a thruster. And if you squirt some hydrazine out of this thruster here, then the spacecraft rotates like that. And if you squirt some out of this one, it rotates like that. Whoops, okay. sorry. I'll stay out of yeah. your way, spacecraft. Yeah. yeah, didn't know you were out in space. Yeah, I know. It's just... um, <laughs> And so if you just keep doing it out of here and doing it out of here, you know, you can control the orientation like this. And that, that's how spacecraft, uh, like Voyager here and Deep Space One and many others, that's how they control their orientation. But we didn't have enough hydrazine for this three-year mission, especially since for myriad technical reasons that I'm not boring you with, I hope I haven't bored you, um, we, we used a lot of extra hydrazine during this rescue. Okay. And so the spacecraft actually didn't have enough hydrazine to control its orientation. Remember, the ion propulsion system propels it someplace. The hydrazine holds its orientation. We didn't have enough hydrazine to actually complete the mission to the comet. Okay. So we had to come up with a, another fix. You are getting very good at this MacGyver yeah. thing. And I'll tell you, this is, I think, maybe one of the last problems we're going to talk about. Okay. There were a bunch of other problems. Um, I mean, it just... We we're kind of talking like three or four in our, this conversation. Right, but, but there yeah. was what happened when radiation from the sun flooded the camera and it got confused. What happens when it lost track of the star? What happens when it couldn't find the star at the end of a turn? I mean, there were a lot of other things going on. Yeah. But, uh, but for this problem, for not being able to control its orientation, it turns out when we thrust with the ion propulsion system, it actually, it's responsible for sending the spacecraft someplace, but it had the capability in addition to control the orientation. So I, I told you a few minutes ago that we thrust most of the time, but we don't thrust all the time. We had to get onto a trajectory where the spacecraft and the comet were basically heading to the same point. So we accomplished that in May of 2001, 
We weren't going to get to that point until September. So in principle, the spacecraft and comet could have just coasted to the same point. But we couldn't afford to coast because we didn't, we couldn't afford yeah. the hydrazine. Yeah. So we had to keep thrusting. But the problem was, when you thrust, you change your course. We didn't want to change course. We were on course for the comet. So we thrust at a low level, which I called impulse power. And people who, who don't get that, you need to do your homework, which is go home and watch Star Trek, the original series. But for the rest of you, that's thrusting at a low throttle level. Thanks. So you've and done your homework already. <laughs> yeah. Well, impulse power, it's low power. So we thrust at impulse power like this, low throttle level, so we didn't do too much damage to the trajectory. We'd thrust like this for a week. Then we'd thrust in the opposite direction for a week. Then we'd thrust in this direction for a week. Then the opposite direction. So basically, I can't turn the spacecraft fast enough here, but basically, we instead of flying to the comet like this, we zigzagged like that, tacking for five months, never being exactly on target for the comet, but constantly canceling out, never getting too far off yeah. course, so that we could take constant advantage of the ion propulsion system to get us to the vicinity of the comet. Well, yeah, like when you're, when I'm driving to New York from here in LA, I'm not Going you know, yeah, there's a lot of zigging and zagging, and you end up. But right. You probably don't zig and zag as much as DS-1 did. Hopefully not. But that, but that actually raises another point, which is all missions, not just DS-1, when we target a destination far in the solar system, you know, initially you aim sort of in the general direction. Mm -hmm. And then as you get closer and closer, you, you kind of have to tweak or adjust the trajectory. Yeah. We call it a trajectory correction maneuver. Closer you get to refine it, just like when you're doing your drive from Los Angeles to New York, yeah. you don't aim for your parking place, you aim for the west coast, yeah. or no, sorry, Los Angeles to New York, I was thinking you were coming home. Coast, yeah. So you aim for the east coast, I'm not a navigator, I'm, okay. Uh, <laughs> you aim for the east coast, uh, and then only when you get close to your parking place do you do the final, yeah. you know, refinements. So that's what we were doing, uh, you know, in the, in the final weeks before the encounter. So you're approaching in, when's the, the scheduled encounter date? So we, we had to uh, get to the comet. From this 14, me. no, from this 14 month journey, you had to get right. to the 15 comet. Month journey. 15 month journey. Um, oh, yeah, so we had to go all 653 million miles. Uh -huh. Let's not leave any miles out here. I won't, um, <laughs> never again. We had to get there on September 22nd. And our one of our maneuvers was not too long before that, it was on a Tuesday. Um, seemed like a day like any other, and uh, so I was at home that morning getting ready to come into work, and a friend of mine who I, I think I saw back here, but maybe not, you know, a friend of mine who's on my team called me that morning and said, uh, aircraft just hit the Twin Towers in New York, uh, you know, this, the United States is under attack. and." sort of like everybody else, I couldn't really yeah. process that, couldn't really understand that, but, but we had a job to do. We had to do a maneuver that day in order to keep the spacecraft on course for the, for the comet. So uh, I, you know, at first I didn't believe him, but it didn't make any difference. Yeah. Told him, you know, let's just go to work and we're gonna focus on this trajectory correction maneuver. So I raced over here to JPL, and everybody, not the people on TV, but everybody who's here today knows that when you approach JPL, you drive along Oak Grove Boulevard here, Oak Grove Drive. I mean, it's just one long, narrow street. It was, of course, jammed with cars because the lab was locked down. Our security friends, who all of you saw today, were not letting anybody in. It didn't matter what your excuse was. The country was under attack, and... Go home. Go home. Yeah. Uh, and there was no excuse. I mean, the guards were not going to be interested in my story. But I have a spacecraft, yeah. Maybe. Right. And so, like everybody else, I tried to turn around on that narrow road and, you know, get home as quickly as I could. This was before the time of um, texting and easy telecom, tele, you know, telecommunications sessions via phone. So we set up among all the team members. Yep. <clears throat> Most of us were at home. Two of the people had come in early that day before the lockdown. 
One guy uh, just worked different hours from the rest of us. He normally got here about 5 and worked till the early afternoon. Somebody else had come in for some other reason that, frankly, I don't even remember. But he had come in before the lockdown. They were in mission control. They weren't comfortable doing this. They didn't know how to do it by themselves. Yeah. So we had everybody set up a telephone tag system, basically. And I had one phone you know, to the next guy in line and one phone to the guys, the two guys in mission control. It happened to be two men, but there were, you know, it was a normal team of men and women. And we basically talked these two nervous people <laughs> through how to send the commands. And the Deep Space Network wasn't locked down. Uh, and in fact, I don't think, you know, I think we weren't even using the one in California at the time. We were using one of the ones in Madrid okay. uh, to send the commands to the spacecraft. And, you know, this whole time you're thinking about, I mean, again, my country's under attack. I don't know what's going on. But, but we had to stay focused. I mean, there was an unambiguous need to get these instructions to the spacecraft so it could execute this maneuver to... to, to catch up with the comet just 11 days later. To get there by September 22nd. Yeah, in fact, actually, I just realized the, the anniversary of that's coming up in just a few days. It yeah. really is coming yeah. up, yes, very, very soon. Um, happy anniversary. Um, <laughs> Thanks, you too. You get there, you, so you, you have this successful maneuver and you're approaching, and there's and, the comet. There's, you worked so hard yeah, to but, get to this point, but it's not over it's yet. It's not over yet. Yeah. So. There were still a lot of challenges ahead. <clears throat> Excuse me. And again, I can't go into all of them, but just a couple here to illustrate. Let me remind you, what we could see from Earth was this big coma, thousands, many, many thousands of miles across, bigger than Earth. Mm -hmm. And the spacecraft had to plunge into that and find the nucleus on its own. And we didn't even know, is the nucleus going to be dark? against the light background of the coma? Or is it going to be bright against the darker background of space? Is it going to look this, about the same brightness as the coma? So the spacecraft actually had to fly into the coma and find the nucleus on its own. <laughs> but let me remind you, of course, it would do that with the camera. Yeah. But it also had to keep turning occasionally to point the, cam point the camera at a star to, um, to sort of fix its attitude. Then it would turn back to the nucleus to you know, look around for the nucleus, then it would turn to a reference star, then it would look at the nucleus, then it would turn to a different so you're reference star. So going back star. and forth and back, back and, and forth. forth. Back and yeah. forth and back and forth and back and forth. And and it was going to be on its own in there. I mean, this was way, way, way too far for us to be able to joystick it. Yeah. And of course, it couldn't be couldn't waste its time pointing its antenna mm -hmm. at Earth. <coughs> Excuse me. But there were challenges beyond even that, okay. because it was flying through the coma at 37,000 miles per hour. I hope that's faster than you drove on Oak Grove Drive today. And so uh, it's plunging into this coma, which is, has not only a lot of gas, but dust in it as well. And so it's flying through this cloud, potentially filled with dust. And it's not as dense as you know, you're the beach, say, okay. but but that has many of these little particles in it. And at this velocity, one particle, one particle smaller than the head of a pin, 80 microns in diameter for those of you who know that, but smaller than the head of a pin, hitting the spacecraft would impart as much energy to the spacecraft as a bowling ball does when it hits the pins. That's not good for the spacecraft health. <laughs> you've saved it from a Star Trek, or you've saved it from zigging and zagging and finding the sun and all of these things, and now you're getting ready to go in through the coma, and a speck of dust could end it all. Right. How did it go? Well, I mean, the reality is th we didn't expect it to be successful. I mean, it shouldn't be. Should not be successful. Should not be successful. And... And in fact, even it didn't go as expected. It didn't go as expected. It was incredibly <laughs> su successful. And maybe you can see that coming, but, I but mean, we didn't here. see yes, it coming. Yes, you can clap yeah. for that. Well, and, 
it, it's, it's nice that you applaud because I'll tell you, after it worked, to me, the biggest risk, there were, there were tons of risks. The biggest risk was the seismic risk to Southern California from the applause that erupted in Mission Control right across the street there. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it was, it was pretty, pretty scary. And here's this incredible image that we got. When we got this, this showed more detail in a comet than we had ever seen. And so you can see here, this is the nucleus. It's a few miles across, and there's this jet of gas. Now, this is not like the long tail that you see from Earth. This, this jet of gas and dust here is maybe 30 or 50 miles long. And so I hope you're impressed with the... Mark, the, getting yeah, the good but, stuff. Okay, yeah. so we actually did do better than that. But when we got this, this was still pretty neat. But then we actually even got a picture where now you could really see the shape. Maybe it looks like a drumstick or a bowling pin. Actually, now that I think of a bowling pin, it's kind a of appropriate. It's a good one, yeah. I thought of that, yeah. So when we got this, this, we were pretty happy about this. But then we also got this. this. And this turned out to be three and a half times better than our best case objective for what we could hope to get. Just hope to get. That's amazing. We got. And we're not going to take the time here. Actually, I see it's, it's getting late. But there's, there's a lot of detail. This was the first time we saw the nucleus of a comet in enough detail to actually do geology on it. This is, again, NASA's first close-up picture of the nucleus of a comet. And you can see this sort of lobe down here. Maybe you can even make out some canyons here. You can see them in the full image, bright areas and dark areas. And in fact, when you look at it like this, you can see these two pieces. They're not stuck together like this. It's more like this. I'm exaggerating it just so you can see. And so the, this really revealed a lot. And this. This was the payoff. I mean, this, when this picture came into mission control, this, that, that event was, that was pretty special. I'll tell you, I mean, we'd been living under a dark cloud for a long time. I mean, in the, in just in the time, in part of the encounter, roughly a half hour around it, the spacecraft, I was just mentioning this to you just, just a few minutes ago, yeah. spacecraft, had 4,700 instructions and parameters that all had to be right in that half hour. And if even one of them was wrong, it wouldn't have worked. That doesn't, I'm not talking about the rescue. I'm not talking about the 15 months of getting there. Just in the half hour. And there were so many times that I thought, you know, if just one of them is wrong, I'm going to spend the rest of my life thinking, you know, if only, if only we'd gotten that one right. It was. So you'd been living in this. In this, until that picture showed up. Yeah. And then when the picture showed up, <laughs> to me, it was, it was this. And everybody, this is my representation. Everybody in mission control, we just went to a happy place. <laughs> and, and uh, this is. This, to me, is what it felt like. And my stressometer went, went way down. And I'll tell you, um, so I, I like to think of myself as being of at least average eloquence. Yeah, you've done a pretty good but job. But for, for three hours after this happened, the only thing I could say every 30 seconds was, I can't believe how incredibly cool this is. <laughs> and. One of my friends, in fact, the same guy who called me on September 11th, told me, <clears throat> we stood outside Mission Control and we cried together. In fact, actually, just thinking about it, it just, it's making me feel that same thing again. <laughs> and, and, and another one of my friends on the team, we were standing together talking about it, and at practically the same time, this was hours later, yeah. practically the same time, we said to each other, I just want to hug you, and we just <laughs> hugged. And, I mean, this, this, was, this was pretty special. Well, let's... This was the high point. I mean, seriously, this, this happened, you know, September of 2001. This was the high point of my professional career. And, you know, as a lifelong space enthusiast, 
seeing this. And you've all seen some, many of my friends and colleagues and others, you know, in mission control on televised events. Of course, this because of 9-11, you know, you didn't hear about it. The world's news was focused on that. You've seen people in mission control jumping and hugging and things like that. I can tell you there's nobody there who felt any more excited, gratified, we did after this rescue. Well, can this we was, see some of those people? Let's skip ahead and take a look yeah, at that Yeah, let's skip ahead. Right there. There's some comet stuff here that we'll, um, I don't think we have time for. Yeah. Let me just quickly show you, if you want to talk about it afterwards, the trajectory we took. But I do want to show you some of the people on the team, because I'm up here getting to share this with you, but I'm not the only one uh, who did it. Um, here is, in effect, this picture here. This was taken before uh, that same day before the comet encounter. Um, this was taken after. Uh, <laughs> and some of these on other days, this was, this was also after. Uh, so this was, this was a great team. And, um, and it was, you know, on behalf of all of you, we were doing this. Um, I think everybody who ever looks up at the night sky and just wonders what's out there, you know, everybody participates in this, and that's why we did it. Do you still and see this team? I do. I mean, I still work with some of them, and the ones I don't work with every day, you know, I often pass outside here on the mall, and in fact, every five years, we have a party on the anniversary of launch. We just had one um, not too long ago, and uh, we still get together, and I would say, and I know there's some here today. It was fun to see uh, Rich and John and a few other people. Uh, and um, I think we share, we share something pretty special. And at the end of the mission, I yeah. uh, just want to show you one more picture. Uh, oh, actually, this is, this is just another picture of, of our rescue team just standing on the steps across the, across the mall there. And then at the end of the mission, we just gave sort of one last farewell <laughs> salute, uh, looking up. Uh, at the sky to say goodbye to the team, and that was our that was our last uh, picture of the team on the last day we communicated with the spacecraft at the end of the mission. So that's our story. That's your story. We're going to open it up for some questions from Mark. If you have a question, please step up to the microphone. If you're watching online, uh, questions are coming up to me right now. Uh, but I'm going to open this up real quick with, do you still have nightmares about this? <laughs> Actually, I do. Uh, so I, I uh, it's funny, I, I actually still have student anxiety dreams. I've been out of school for a long time. In fact, I actually, this is true. I had a dream not too long ago that I was in the third grade. And you know I'd missed classes. I didn't know where I was supposed to be, hadn't done the homework. And even in the dream, I thought, gosh, I thought I have a PhD, but I guess not. <laughs> but, but I still, still regularly have dreams about DS1. Either we can't save it, or more commonly, we rescued it. We're heading for the comet, but we're not prepared for the encounter. Yeah. Or, wait a second, I think the encounter was an hour ago and we never even <laughs> finished preparing and aren't I supposed to be at JPL and Mission Control? I'm at home and yeah, I still have, I still have those anxiety dreams, but I always wake up and go back to that happy place. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, so if we don't get a chance to get to everybody today, Mark is going to stick around for, for a few minutes. He, yeah, be happy to. He'll be happy to talk for a little bit more, but first question. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, two questions. First, do you have a working theory as to why this star tracker failed? And second, the image that you showed of the comet, it reminds me of the uh, 2014 MU69 Ultima yeah. Thule. So is this, do you think this is a contact binary or something that forms simili similarly to that? Okay, so the first question, uh, everybody heard it, but just to remind you, was do we have an idea of what happened to the star tracker? And in short, no. Uh, the Star Tracker, again, wasn't one of our new technologies. Uh, we, of course, once we determined that it wasn't working, we were focused on saving the spacecraft and you know, rescuing the spacecraft and moving on. But we did have a separate group of people to look at all the telemetry we got from the spacecraft once we had the main antenna pointed at Earth. And we even uh, sent some instructions to the spacecraft to run some diagnostic tests and things like that. And JPL and NASA go through a formal process to 
um, investigate things like this. And I mean, is it okay to say this? Yeah, right? I think it is. Okay, so please do. It's their my conclusion part. was, <coughs> their conclusion was, it just crapped out. <laughs> so no official uh, report. Right. The other question, I'm going to rephrase it, but this gentleman recognizes that uh, earlier this year, uh, the New Horizons spacecraft flew by an object um, in the Kuiper Belt. The largest object in the Kuiper Belt you've all heard of is Pluto. Maybe you've heard of others. And in some ways, it looks like Comet Borelli. <coughs> that is, two objects of different size sort of stuck together. Comet Cheryov Gerasimenko looks similar to that as well, and others do too. So there, this seems to be a theme in the solar system. Borelli was the, uh, an early subject object, early one to be discovered. But now we're seeing more and more of these that apparently were formed when, using exactly the words you did, it's a contact binary. Two objects that at some point in the solar system history came together not fast enough to smash apart, slowly enough perhaps to join and stay joined like that. And so this provides valuable information about processes uh, for how these so-called small bodies, that, that picture I showed you, that object is only five miles from end to end. So how these small bodies form, and we're learning more about the evolution of the solar system from that. We're going to go online, and okay. then you will be next. Uh, Niels asks, has NASA become more willing to fund cheap, fast, and slightly more risky missions after DS-1? It has. I mean, so NASA it has to find the right balance. We're investing your personal tax dollars and my tax dollars as well. Mm -hmm. So you have to manage the risk, right? You can't take irresponsible risks. But by the same token, we recognize that not, we can't afford to spend a billion or several billion dollars on every mission. When you spend a billion dollars, you get a fabulous return. Fabulous. But we, we can't do a lot of missions like that. And so NASA has a balanced program from the big expensive missions now to the smaller, riskier missions <coughs> where you take more responsible risk. And, and I think that's paying off very well for NASA. Very great. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, does the spacecraft have reaction wheel for con orientation? And also, uh, could you explain a little more how you use the thruster to control orientation? OK, so yeah. for everybody else, the gentleman referred to devices called reaction wheels, which are sort of like gyroscopes. They're uh, disks which you spin electrically. And by changing the speed at which you spin these disks, you can control the orientation of the spacecraft. Some spacecraft carry them, but Deep Space One did not. And so we couldn't use that. As a brief aside, a mission that I just finished working on, this one that's orbiting this dwarf planet, which was NASA's second mission to use ion propulsion, it used it because we tested it on Deep Space One, did have these reaction wheels, and they all failed. So in fact, actually, we ought to Seriously, we ought to have another thing of it broke too, it, and we fixed it. But anyway, so reaction wheels have their own problems. Uh, and just briefly, yeah. the other question I think you're asking is how did we use the ion engine to control the orientation? So the ion engine, unlike Laura Ratliff's sophisticated model here, it wasn't fixed. It was actually mounted on a gimbal. And so we could pivot it like this. And so we could tip and tilt it to control the orientation. It was a little more complicated than that, but, but that's the short answer. We're going to go to another online one real quick. And you, I think this is one that you can summarize real quick. Yeah, I kind tend of to give already answers. Oh, no, 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 no. That's why we love you, Mark. <laughs> uh, what was the main takeaway? What were the main takeaways and benefits? And this is from Joe. Benefits to humanity from this mission. The benefits to humankind from the mission, I think there are several. Mm -hmm. I think one of the benefits from, okay, you said to be quick. You asked the wrong guy for I a quick did, answer. I, I knew what I was um, getting into. Yeah. I think one of them is the kind of thing I showed in that first picture. I mean, we have, we have spacecraft out among the stars. I think, you know, even when, when humankind demonstrates some of its worst attributes, like it did on 9-11, we also can demonstrate some of our best. We can rise above things. And 
once again, I think everybody shares in this sort of thing, seriously. And I, I'm proud to live in a country and a culture that can, that can invest in learning about the mysteries of the cosmos. I mean, we take the best of humankind, science and technology, to undertake noble missions that, you know, nurture our souls and that teach us about the cosmos. And I think everybody who's ever felt that, that longing to know the universe, to carry out a bold adventure far from home, anybody who's ever looked at the night sky and wonder, seriously, I mean, this is, this is what I think. Everybody participates in a mission like this, and I think there's real value. I mean, this is real science. We're not just saying, maybe this works this way, maybe this works that way. We don't make this stuff up. I mean, the, the real test is, can you fly more than a billion miles to a comet, get these data, and then learn something about the solar system from it? And can we commit to undertaking these adventures and in the face of adversity, like in Galaxy Quest, never give up, never surrender, um, which, I mean, I think is a words to live by. Uh, can we do that? So I think, I think that's, that's the kind of thing. Of course, there are a lot of specific lessons. One of them is don't let your Star Tracker fail. Yep. Um, you know, there are a lot of specific things. But to me, these are some of the big kinds of things that are of value to humankind um, that, that I think enrich all of us. Yeah. That's what I think. Thank you. Uh, a systems architecture question with two parts. What sort of mission uh, does ion propulsion make the most sense? The other question is, if ion propulsion is used, which tends to be unidirectional long duration, does that drive you towards steerable high gain antenna, steerable cameras? Okay, so the first question is, what kind of missions uh, is ion propulsion suitable for? Is that a, okay. yes. any mission where you need to do a lot more maneuvering, a lot of thrusting, very, very high velocity. Uh, and so the, the mission, this other mission that I've referred to a couple of times, Dawn, which I've just recently worked on, is the only spacecraft ever, in more than 60 years of exploring the solar system, this is the only spacecraft that we sent to a distant solar system destination, Vesta, the second largest object between Mars and Jupiter, went into, excuse me, went into orbit around it, maneuvered in orbit, broke out of orbit, and then went to dwarf planet Ceres and orbited it. It's the only spacecraft ever to orbit two extraterrestrial destinations. And that mission would be not just difficult, but impossible, impossible with conventional chemical propulsion. Yeah, yeah. And now JPL right now is working on another mission called Psyche, P-S-Y-C-H-E, which is going to launch in August of 2022 fly to the main asteroid belt again. Dawn's the only spacecraft that's ever orbited an object in the main asteroid belt, and the first one to get to a dwarf planet, Ceres. It's going to orbit an object called Psyche, which we believe to be the metal core of a protoplanet early in the solar system history that broke up. It would be impossible with conventional propulsion. So missions like that. It's also being considered for future missions to Mars, where you want to bring a sample back from Mars. We can't do that with conventional propulsion. And briefly, you uh, said unidirectional. It's not unidirectional at all. You can point the spacecraft any direction you want to point the ion engine. The articulated high-gain antenna, it's a little technical for discussing here. It's convenient, but by no means required. DS-1 didn't have one. Dawn didn't have one. Psyche doesn't have one. And all these missions do fine. It might be more convenient, but articulated high-gain antennas have their own problems. For other people, that just means an antenna that you can independently move on the spacecraft. Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Right. So we've got time for one last question. So if you're in one line, last question in this in, in this forum. format, and then you yeah. can, and then I'll do one quick wrap up. So this is our last question. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Told really well. Um, sure. So uh, when the Star Tracker failed. Uh, you mentioned that a lot of people uh, thought this was the end of the mission. Yeah. Uh, how did you convince uh, people working for you and people you worked for and people you worked with 
that it was worth pursuing uh, into the extended mission because this wasn't prime mission; this was extended, so you could could easily cut your losses and just and not continue. And then, how did your posture uh, toward risk change uh, once you decided to go on with the extended mission? This and way? you're exactly right. I mean, we could well, everybody could well have said uh, this is fate and just end it, and as I said earlier, probably let it rest on its laurels. Uh, it was we projected to some people perhaps an unrealistically optimistic assessment, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, this seems fatal, but I mean, we, we know what we're doing here, you know, we're going to go. I mean, to, the, to, to my team, it was in all seriousness, let's review Galaxy Quest, never give up, never surrender. You know, wouldn't this be fun if we rescued this and we could have shirts made that say <laughs> Deep Space One Rescue Team, and some of you who know me know that I still wear shirts like that sometimes. In fact, the briefcase that I brought tonight that I bring to JPL every day says on it, Deep Space One Rescue Team. Wouldn't it be cool if we had, you know, rescue team things? We can do this. You know, let's not give up now. And because we already had some funding for doing this two-year extended mission, obviously a responsible thing to do is for NASA headquarters not to commit to giving us all of that. But because there was some already available, we asked just for enough to see if we could get the main antenna pointed to Earth. Because that would allow us to diagnose the star tracker problem completely, to give us a shot at continuing. And another thing that I didn't have talk, time to talk about here, but I'll just briefly mention, two days before the failure, we had taken advantage of our advanced technology camera to take high quality infrared spectra. Maybe you don't know what that means, but I'll tell you later high-quality infrared spectra of Mars. They were on board the spacecraft and stranded there because we could only send them down through the main antenna. I hadn't told no, you about that. No, we hadn't talked about that. So let us just, just see if we can do this. Then we'll get those data down. We'll definitively diagnose the star tracker where we know what the definitive diagnosis was now, <laughs> crapped out. And, and by then, maybe we'll think of something else we can do. And so it was this sort of incremental process. And it didn't cost a lot. We had a very small team, very small, perhaps uniquely small, I'm not sure, but, but certainly very small. So there was not a lot of money. And DS-1, by its nature, its goal was to take the risks so that subsequent missions didn't have to. Here was a risk we had never thought about, but, but NASA and JPL were very supportive of our, of our attempt to do this. And it paid off, so thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that's all the time that we have for questions. Uh, one last YouTube comment from Fidelio says, it's sweet that you held on to that foam model for over 12 years. <laughs> um, Let's thank Laura again for making that for making model. That model. Uh, that is all the time we have for tonight. I, please join us in October. We're going to be doing It's Darkness Surrounds Us, the other 95% of the universe. We're going to take a deep dive into dark energy and dark matter. Um, but as Mark pointed out, there are so many missions that we urge you to go and take a look at of these things that have happened. Mark expressed with his team, there are so many brilliant people working on all of these different things that go. This was one amazing, beautiful, incredible example of, of something that we fixed. So go do your research. Go learn about all these other things. And let's thank Dr. Raymond one last time. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you here at home. We'll see you next time. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Great time. Great time. So if you're listening to me, I presume you're going to turn off the microphone. Hmm? I was telling him to turn off the microphone. Okay. I was really worried about my voice. It worked out. It worked great.